Welcome to the Health on Track podcast. Let's talk well-being. Welcome to the Health on Track podcast, offering you a shot of wellness. I'm Yasmin, and I'm the Member Engagement and Communications Manager at GIG Golf Insurance. The episode today is about exercise and fitness, but we're not here to tell you that it's important because you probably already know that. We are here today to tell you what's the minimum amount of exercise that you need to be in an acceptable level of fitness. We know not everyone wants to go hiking and climbing mountains. I certainly don't, but you also want to be fairly active and fit. So we've got you. Our guest today is Jason Grima, a reputable strength and conditioning coach with over a decade of experience. He's the founder and head coach at the 365 Physique and has guided clients towards diverse health goals such as major weight loss, muscle building, sports performance, youth development, and injury prevention. He's also a fellow podcaster and the host of The Lifestyle Hub, a podcast that addresses multiple life challenges. Welcome, Jason. Hello. It's nice to have you. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your gym and your approach to your clients. Cool. So as you mentioned, our gym's called the 365 Physique, and we basically encourage individuals to embrace a year-round journey of self-transformation, and we try to get them to foster more of a holistic approach and obviously tackle things in regards to mindset and physical ability as well. So it's like a combination of the two. Do you also cover nutrition? Because Definitely. it's obviously a big aspect. Of course we do, yes. Nutrition is very important. So we kind of try to take care of everything when it comes to that health and wellness sector for them. And we try and give it more of like a 365 day approach. So it's more of a long-term sustainable method rather than anything too short and sharp. Okay, yeah. Uh, consistency is key, I believe. Consistency is key. That's definitely something. Did you hear that from somewhere with me? Or? Everybody, no, <laughs> everyone, but says, everyone says that. I mean, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm definitely on that bandwagon. That consistency approach, especially in a world where everybody wants something now and they want it fast, I think that's the biggest mistake people make when it comes to health and wellness, and it needs to be more of a consistent long-term approach. And I think we're going to talk about a lot of that today, which I'm excited to share with you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's start from the basics. Uh, why is being fit important for you physically and mentally? So there's obviously two really important sides to this. So from a mental and health, let's start with the physical side. Okay, we'll keep it simple. So from a physical perspective, you have the benefits like obviously posture, general strength. We have the confidence that comes with looking and feeling a certain way visually. Um, we have the benefits from an injury prevention perspective. I mean, we're sitting at desks a long period of the day. Mm -hmm. So being able to try and modify and work around things like stiff backs, tight hamstrings, neck and, and, and neck muscular pain and that kind of thing. So obviously having a percentage of muscle and strength and fitness is going to help. Um, so the physical side can really be so important, but I think it gets overlooked because the mental side is so much more important. So this is where obviously we'll see things like the endorphin release to help with positive energy. Um, general energy as well. Exercising will help with sleep quality and the improved sleep will help lower stress. It's like this really, you know, simple but very hard and valuable little concept to try and get over. So you've got, you know, fitness being the most um, natural way or mat most natural antidepressant. So for a lot of people, obviously, in high stress jobs, going through any sort of mental health challenges, fitness is really the key before I think, you know, not that I can say before medication, but I think it's a very natural, simple road that one should be obviously looking to when it comes to any sort of mental challenges they might face. So mindset is huge when it comes to, to fitness, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people also use exercise and fitness as a way to just release some of the stress. So after you've had a long day, then you can just go for a jog or a walk and, and somehow you just feel better. That's right, yeah. It's got a good feeling. Yeah. Okay, so what is the threshold to which you use? Like if you say that someone is fit or someone is not fit, what, what, how, do we, how do we identify that? Yeah, this is a good one. Like I think that's, that, that, that parameter is so broad, right? So obviously we've got so many people in different walks of life. Um, I think when we look at it from a corporate wellness perspective too, we've got a, a, a wide range of different age brackets um, and experiences. So when, when, when you ask that kind of question, I think the most basic way to define this would be just on your resting heart rate. So you'll have a, let's say a room full of people and we'd identify those that are a little bit more fit um, or healthy by the, their resting heart rate. So you could figure that out right now if you're listening to this, you could basically just pop your two, your two fingers on either on the neck, on the artery or onto the wrist and you would count simply the beats 
that you would need to be in a quiet space, but you'd have 60 seconds. And that would be roughly your resting heart rate. A lot of us have Apple watches, so you could also check the heart rate on there. And when you look at your resting heart rate, we would identify someone that is of a higher fitness caliber to be below 60. So athletes would be generally 40. So if your resting heart rate is around 60 or less, um, that's a good sign. If you're over 60 up to 100, then that would indicate potentially it's probably time to start a health and wellness regime. We're under a little bit of stress. The body's probably not as relaxed or as composed as it should be. So that's like the most basic measure. But then of course, from there, we can make it more intense and that could be like for me i like to make sure that everyone can you should be able to maintain a 30 minute brisk walk i think if we go to the absolute bare minimum is can you go out put the shoes on right now go for a brisk 30 minute walk without feeling like that's taken the absolute air out of you for the rest of the day um and i think that's probably the best place for you know maybe the listeners today if they're questioning their their current fitness to start with that yeah, that was my point. I wanted to, people to, to be able to identify where they are because a lot of people think like, oh my God, I'm so far gone and yes. I'm really not fit. And then that kind of depresses them and makes them feel like, no, I have such a long way, yeah. but it's actually not as bad as you think. Yes. So, okay, but a burst quark, not like just a yeah, no, hole it, in the it, ball. Yeah, I love that one. Because especially in Dubai with the heat, we get a lot of people who will say, Oh, I've just done my, my exercise in the mall and I'm like, mm, it's not quite a brisk walk. You, you would identify a brisk walk to be around 135 beats per minute. So that's kind of where you may be unable to hold a conversation on the phone. You'd feel like slightly short of breath. That's where we would be in the window where we're actually getting some benefit from that form of, and we would classify that as like exercise rather than just day-to-day -day walking. Um, but of course that metric can be a lot, you know, for me at the 365, I like to identify people's physical fitness as being able to run five kilometers. So now that's not initial, that's over a 365 day window, but by the end of 365 days, whether you like running or not, whether you want to become a runner or not, I like everyone to be capable of simply running five kilometers, because I think it's important for you that should the opportunity arise that you could put your runners on and say, you know what, I'm going to go for a nice 5k run around this city or that or around the street or with a friend or anything like that. And I think for me, that's like a measure of, of a well-rounded kind of fitness level. Okay. And for those of us who don't understand kilometers and yes. that's myself included, when you say 5k, how long of a time is it like a 30 minute run, yes. an hour run? So I would say to be under 30 minutes for 5k would be considered quite good. So I think for the average person, when I see somebody start on with me, most people are barely able to run, I mean, a K in one go. So over, you got to think about it, it's 12 months. And I think when you have that, like we said at the start, that consistent long-term approach, you really break it down, it's not too bad. Eventually I have people coming below the 40 minute mark. Um, this is aside from anybody that has any sort of injuries, knee issues, back issues, um, obviously pre or post pregnancy, that's when running wouldn't really be applicable. But to the average person who's looking to, to be health and healthy and well, um, under 40 minutes is pretty good. Okay, yeah. okay, good. But so that's 30 more, to 40 minutes. Exactly. That's a more intense guide. So if you're going to go out today and check your fitness, I would start, with the, start with the heart rate. Then you can obviously try the brisk walk and then maybe later in the week, you can try the 5K. Later in the week, not like in the month? <laughs> no, I think, well, why not? The momentum, momentum's high after listening oh, to okay. today. So yeah. let's give it a go. Okay. Um, so, so where does someone start? Like if you say someone wants to be fairly fit, they don't, they're not running marathons, they're not you know, climbing mountains or anything. They just want to be reasonably and acceptably fit. How many times uh, should they work out in a week? Yeah. So great question, because a lot of people these days, especially with social media being our main access point for information, there's so 10, many 10,000 steps. You got to get agree. your 10,000 steps. Yes. There's so much information on, on, on online platforms. So it's hard for people to actually know what's important. I think the most important thing and the where I would bring it down to, and it's one of our main beliefs at the 365 physique, which is the way I kind of use it as a metaphor is rent is due. Okay. That's my main metaphor that we have. And basically rent and rent is due interprets my belief that we need to do some form of sweat debt daily. So I believe that everybody should at some point for at least 15 minutes, have their body experience some sort of sweating. And that could be and that would for a lot of people start with a walk because I believe that's once we hit that 15 minute threshold, and we've been sweating for 15 minutes, our heart rates over 135 beats per minute. That's when you start to feel all the amazing endorphin release. Now, for somebody who's time poor, I would say the first thing you could start with is just that walk every day. Now, the walk every day is going to stimulate so many creative thoughts. 
It's going to help with setting up a routine. It's going to help with you like generalizing your, your layout with your nutrition. You're going to know that it's time for a walk. You'll get back, you'll have your breakfast or maybe your dinner before if this is an evening protocol. Um, but for me, I think that's like the most basic level of, of movement. Um, if we're to take it into a more exercise sense or like, you know, I want to do something more than a walk. How many times should I do it? I would say three days a week is a really adequate amount to do to dedicate to like any sort of exercise regime without putting it on gym or weight specifically i would say three times doing any sort of skill activity based skill is going to be a great place to start so for three times a week are we saying an hour 30 minutes how long i think it would depend on the skill but again if you wanted me to give you like i'll give you the real inf the real golden gems today so i would say three strength sessions is going to be the best place for people listening to this episode to start. Um, if you're not doing anything at the moment, committing to three strength-based training sessions a week is going to give you the most amount of return in time, obviously in investment, um, value when it comes to like getting yourself in the right shape. You're gonna feel amazing lifting weights. It's gonna change your body. The more muscle we have, um, the better our body's gonna metabolize. Um, we're gonna feel great, look great. So for me, three sessions of strength training, roughly 30, to 60 minutes is kind of the sweet spot. Okay, and just for those who are very um, starting fresh with yes. fitness, uh, can you tell us the difference between cardio training and uh, muscle training or weights, as you say? So cardiovascular training will typically focus more on like heart and lung health. Um, it can be utilized effectively to focus on burning calories, which can obviously aid in weight loss. Um, it's a great way to build cardiovascular stamina. So for anybody who's wanting to compete or to participate in any sort of endurance-based activity, so sport of any kind, getting up to running like we spoke about earlier, um, that's where cardio would come into it. I think the most important thing is if we look at a lot of our cardiovascular diseases and heart-based diseases, one of the best ways to obviously deter our body from encountering any of those is to work on our cardiovascular health. So making sure the lungs and the heart are healthy. Um, so that's where you could utilize your cardio. Um, my belief is that there should, be a com there should be a combination between cardiovascular training and strength training um, for you to have like the perfect weekly fitness routine. Um, our strength training is going to focus more on obviously our muscle development, which will work on our posture, injury prevention. Um, it'll help with like anti-aging. It'll help with metabolism. Um, the, the look at the strength training as like kind of like building a foundation. Like it's like, you know, you're building the sculpture and then the cardio is kind of just like you're trimming away the edges or you're kind of like fine tuning things a little bit. That's how I kind of look at the two. The, the strength is really the foundation. So, okay. Yeah. It's good you say that because I mean, I think a lot of people have uh, the opposite uh, idea in mind that cardio is more important because everybody says like cardio is for your heart and your heart is more sure. important than, you know, muscles or looking good or, or you know, having that toned body. Uh, so I think there's a myth out there that cardio is more important. Yeah, I, I would definitely be in the camp for the strength training. Um, again, common misconception is that, you know, particularly for females, they'll generally like to try to allocate more time into cardiovascular training because they're worried about looking bulky or gaining too much muscle. Ladies, you don't need to worry. Um, genetically and physically and hormonally, you will not be able to build muscles similar to males would. Um, the most important thing and what a lot of uh, females would like, would like is a more toned, you know, defined figure or shape. Um, and this will definitely come through strength training. Um, and I think that's one thing that's an absolute goldmine. So when it comes to those two, would you do, you know, is, is cardio or strength training more important? It's always going to be strength-based training. Your heart rate is also up when you're doing weights. Yeah. So, you know, you would have felt that I'm sure before at some stage, you're doing your weight session and you can feel like you're a bit out of breath. You're still sweating. You're still burning calories. Um, so it is a really healthy practice. And I think now with the, there are different fitness classes that kind of incorporate the two. So things like boxing or um, what is it? CrossFit, yes. uh, TRX. There's just some other things that you can just do both. And then you saves yourself, save yourself having to think of, should I do cardio or should I do uh, muscle training? Then you can just do both. Definitely. So at the 365 Physique, we focus primarily on a combination of the two. And if you're following any sort of social pages at the moment, what you'd probably notice with the industry is that there's a big push around what's called hybrid training. So this hybrid training trend at the moment basically incorporates strength training and cardiovascular training in one. I've been doing it for years, for 15 years basically, because I come from a sports-based background. So I've always had like 
be fit in the sport, do strength to stay safe in the sport, and it kind of goes two and two. But now in the in the general fitness world at the moment, it's trending. So I would say it's a good trend time to jump on that trend and to start to learn and educate yourself on doing a little bit of cardio, combining it with some weights, and you will not be disappointed with the results. Yeah, speaking of social media, there's also these like so many inf so much information out there, and it's always like you need to do yoga for flexibility, and you need to go for ten thousand steps for your heart health, and you need to do that for your muscles, and there's just a lot of stuff which can make people feel overwhelmed. Like, which which is it? Do I do yoga, or do I go for a run, or do I just do some squats? Like, what what do I do? So, is there a preferred way of training, or is there something that you would normally recommend uh, that people do? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's such a, a confusing initial step. And I think that's where the first things first is identifying what you as an individual um, value. What's the most important thing to you? And let's be honest, for a lot of people, they're wanting to really feel a little bit better about themselves. I think that's where this all stems from when it comes to health and wellness, whether it be from a health perspective, a confidence perspective, you yourself as a person are not feeling as good as you would like. And that's where kind of that initial start or stepping stone for fitness begins. From there, I would recommend people to try and identify what that main goal is. And for a lot of people, again, I'm being stereotypical, I would say for most of us, there's some form of weight loss involved. Fat loss, weight loss to some degree. It might be two kilos, five kilos, 10 kilos, 20. Whatever it is, there's a fat loss component to that. So that's where I would be saying to people, go to the most direct route to be able to achieve that initial goal and that initial feeling. Um, and that for me would be a combination of cardiovascular training and strength training. So let's say, for example, you mentioned steps before. So the ideology behind steps is to just basically encourage you to increase your daily activity rate. So for a lot of you listening to this, if you looked at your watch right now, depending on the time, you're probably not over 4,000 steps if you've woken up, driven to work, sat at your desk, driven home. So for me, we use the eight to 12,000 guideline as a benchmark to make you have a more encouraged, uh, encouraged, sorry, to have a more active daily lifestyle. The other thing to think about is when you're not sitting as much, you're generally probably not eating as much. You know, some of us eat while we're walking, <laughs> occasionally it'll depend. But I'd like to think typically when we're eating the most indulgent foods or we're kicking our feet up as if we're on the couch or at our desk and we're snacking or whatnot. And that's when the calories start to pile in. So that's why we use that step target as a bit of a like, get off the couch, let's go do that extra 3,000 because we got home from work, we've done 4,000. Let's go for 20 minutes, let's hit 3,000 extra. Now we're around the seven, 8,000 mark. We've also saved ourselves 30 minutes from the pantry being the biggest temptation. And then you get home, it's dinner time. You're also feeling really motivated because that was a really, you know, uh, endorphin releasing activity. You sweat a little bit. You've seen everyone else being active as well. And it will encourage you then to have something better for dinner. So it's like this, like these steps, it's not the number per se, because a lot of people are like, what's this 10,000 steps? It's like the, the positive behaviors that come around being more active in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, thank you um, for explaining that. Yeah, I, I went off on a bit of tangent there, but I think I so often hear this like, what's this 10,000 steps? So to just come back to your original question, the most important thing is to, for me when I see people first come in is it's you need to get some form of weight loss. So I would be gravitating towards what's going to give you the most direct you know, element of weight loss. And that's going to be cardiovascular combined with strength training. So cardio, some steps, walks, 30 minutes, treadmill, um, walks, cycling, swimming, combine that with some strength training. Then from there, you can really like the world's your oyster. Like I believe in variety. So chase whatever you love to do. If you love dancing, that could be your cardio. Okay, if you like playing sport, that could be your cardio. So yeah, I think the initial thing people like to often, this is why I was kind of, I've gone on a little bit about this question, but I loved it because what happens is people come into it feeling like there's so many things to do, but you need to like listen, like just narrow it down a little bit and think about what do I want? What's the thing I want right now? And for a lot of us, it's some form of weight loss. What's the most effective way? Let's do that. Dedicate yourself to that for six weeks, drop two kilos, and then you'll feel so good. And then you'll have all these options. Yeah, and I think um, like the key here is consistency, like we said. So if you enjoy that activity or whatever it is that you're doing, you are going to be able to be consistent. But if it's something that feels like a chore, yes. then you're just you're not able you're not going to be able to just continue doing that for a long time. That's right. And don't settle for an environment, um, listeners, that 
isn't making you feel motivated or happy. If you're currently doing something that you feel like you're dreading going to, then maybe it's time to stop, have a look to see what else is out there, work with some different individuals, try some different activities. You will find something that you absolutely love. Um, you just kind of have to keep experimenting. It's a bit of a trial and error, error kind of process. So yeah. Yeah, true. Uh, and I think the thing with also when, when you're working out, it just puts you in that mentality to like, okay, I've already put so much effort today in my workout. I'm not going to go have that pizza. I'd rather have a salad or some grilled chicken or something because I don't want to waste the effort that I did. So I think this is also kind of why the steps help you because when you put in the effort to get, yes. the, to get in the steps, then it's going to help me to resist the temptation of, you know, carbs and sweets. I'll ask you a question. So have you ever met or know anyone or yourself personally followed in just the nutrition protocol without any training that you've been able to sustain long term? It's quite tough. I, I've actually never met somebody that's been able to long-term sustain just the nutrition process or plan or diet without any training long-term. The reason for that is you don't get that endorphin release, that justification as to why I'm, I'm managing my food the way you are. So when someone follows a quite a strict diet plan, it's very challenging to wake up every day, follow that plan without any form of exercise being a part of your day. Put the, the, put the shoe on the other foot, if you were to just focus on training, ignore your diet, eat whatever you wanted, but you focus on training consistently, not always would you lose weight because sometimes the energy balance can be you know, working against us. We know that it's harder to burn off the calories that we consume, but the positive association with exercise will generally lead to the point you just mentioned, which is that positive, you know, uh, not, you don't have the urge to self-sabotage all the hard work. So if you constantly, consistently turn up for exercise, you'll probably go, you know what, tonight we're going to eat healthier for dinner. And if that happens twice a week, perfect. It was better than last week because last week was seven days bad. Yeah. This week's five days bad, two, two days good. And then eventually that starts to kind of spiral into three days good, seven days good. It, it will just keep building. And I think that's really the key. It's like exercise, guys. Exercise, exercise, exercise and everything else will fall into place. Be that as it may, I'm gonna ask you actually about nutrition right now. Yes, let's go. <laughs> so um, there are all these formulas mm. of you should eat protein more, you should eat fiber, you should have zero carbs, zero fat, high fat, low fat. There's just all these formulas and theories of what the best diet approach is. Yeah. What would you say is the best diet approach that's more balanced and more holistic, that doesn't work on deprivation? Yes. So, you know, it's, it is a tricky one. Like the health and wellness industry is full of information and full of misconceptions, full of myths, full of bad information, full of um, different fads and obviously different people or companies trying to make money here or there. So for us, it's so hard to know what's right. The one thing that we know and that's been proven time and time again is obviously being in a, in a deficit of energy is gonna be the most efficient and effective way to lose weight. Okay, so that would be what's called a calorie deficit where you are burning more than you're consuming. Um, for a lot of people, it requires you to eat less than your daily you know, exercise rate. Or what you would burn daily, you would need to consume slightly less, five to 10 to 40%, depending on how aggressive you wanna take it. Over time, you would lose weight. Okay, so that's kind of how it works in a nutshell. Now, the hard thing for people is to try and identify the right way, you know, the right process, the right different fad that's out there. For me, what's gotten my clients the best results over the year is to understand that person and to find what is something they enjoy the most. And whatever that might be, to make sure whatever that is, we put them in a 5% deficit. So if you're saying to me, look, um, I don't eat meat products, I wouldn't be trying to push that onto somebody. We would simply try to get our protein through you know, vegetable sources or, or alternative sources, and then we'd put you in a 5% deficit. If you like to eat keto, then I'd say, fine, let's try that, but let's put you in a 5% deficit. If obviously you like very cultural-based cooking, cuisines in this part of the world, obviously a lot of Arabic um, clientele, we deal with a lot of South, South Asian clientele who are very like brought up and passionate about their home-cooked foods, why would I then try to convince them to have you know, let's say a steak and vegetables every night. Ultimately, that's never going to last. So let's go, let's have, you know, your Arabic mezzo, but then have a 5% deficit of food. You know, let's try and, you know, work on being in that energy deficit. So that's going to be the best way. Um, but you've got to try and tailor the right plan to the individual. 
And that's where, when we see this blanket information online, everyone's like, oh, I'm gonna try that because everyone else is trying it. And then it just might not fit. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, and speaking of, uh, you know, everything, all the information online, um, are there certain foods or supplements that you recommend your clients to have pre-workout and post-workout? Because that, that's also a whole other thing, like yeah. pre-workout, post-workout. Sure. So very important, obviously, to make sure that we fuel ourselves effectively. I would say a lot of people overthink this part. It's a lot more simple than you think. Um, there's a lot of variables to this as well. It depends on the times that you're training um, in the day. So let's look at the typical morning scenario, and then we can do an evening scenario for those people listening. So if you're a morning person, for a lot of people, they probably can't stomach too much before the gym. So if you're training at 6 or 7 a.m. before work, I would say it is okay for you to go into that session with sometimes nothing in your stomach, or maybe half a banana, a date, half an apple, um, something light that body can process and digest quickly. Um, you'll know if you need something before exercise because you'll probably feel a little bit nauseous or lightheaded. So if you, that is happening to you, it's probably a sign that you should have something before training. Um, for me, I love to have a coffee or a bit of caffeine, a bit of a natural energy boost before I train. Um, and the same would apply in the evening. If you're going to train pre-evening, make sure that you've not the last meal you had was at midday at lunch and then you're rocking up to the gym at 6 6 p.m and trying to obviously then work so you would need to have something similar half a banana apple a date um, a little bit of a carbs of some kind that your body can process quite easily so that would be the, the key with pre-training um, think of pre-training as like fueling yourself for the session the post-workout i think is there's a obviously a big misconception around needing to have a protein shake after training. It's not the magic formula, okay? It's not gonna, if you miss your protein shake, it's not gonna undo all the training. Protein shakes or basically the concept behind having protein before, after training is gonna help obviously increase your daily protein amount through the day. Protein shakes is a great way for busy people to keep their protein in. You know, you're getting dressed and then racing to work. You can have it in the car. It's all ready to go, easy to prepare, um, quite cost effective as well. Um, so I would be saying something like a protein shake, but it could also easily be, you know, your next meal, breakfast. It might be eggs. It might be a sandwich. It might be um, a chia pudding with some protein inside. It could be Greek yogurt with berries. There's so many different things. There's no real key the problem where people get unstuck is not having something after training for an hour to two hours afterwards. If that happens, you're gonna get lightheaded, your work performance is gonna drop, you're gonna feel like tired and lethargic, you're gonna feel low on energy. So yeah, I would say don't overthink the post-training meal. Um, get some energy in, try to keep it protein-based and try to keep that 30 to 60 minutes post-training. Yeah, because there are all these things like if you have a banana after a workout, then it helps with the sore muscles because of the potassium in bananas. And yeah. there is um, that during the workout, you kind of break down your muscles. So you need to have protein after to build them back up. Yeah. So there's just all these things that, you know, I, you don't know, yes. like someone who's just, you know, an average employee working, finishing their works. They don't know yeah. what they should actually listen to and what yeah. they shouldn't. Yeah, I, there's again, like I, there's so much information out there, but I would say just keep it very simple. Um, when it comes to post-training, just get some food in. Like if we were to like, if I was to give you two gems today, it would be have something small before you train and it could almost be anything. Have something small that's going to give you energy and afterwards have something within 30 to 60 minutes that's going to give you energy. Like, or it's going to help top up the, the energy that you've just depleted in your training. If you just follow that basic rule, we're already on the right track. If you want to go a step further, then something like a banana could obviously help with like cramps or muscle recovery. Um, protein will help with muscle recovery as well. So yeah, there's, there's so many things out there, but this is where sometimes getting in touch with like, uh, again, not to plug personal training, but there's so many health professionals out there, dietitians, personal trainers, et cetera that if you were to get to sit with somebody, explain to your schedule, they could really give you, say, hey, look, you're training in the morning, let's do this. And you know, even I think people coming out of school, did you guys learn much about like fitness and health and nutrition in school? No. No, we learned so many different topics. And I think most of you listening would have probably gone through educations. Probably, I mean, most of you I know haven't done any nutrition because I'm seeing you in the gym. And I think it's such a fundamental thing. If you were to learn coming through high school or even to university, what's going to be the optimal foods to just, you know, amplify your ability to study or to learn more, imagine how much better that would have been. But instead, obviously, um, we go through so many different areas and it's not until you're 30, usually or above, that you're then trying to sit with a trainer and say, what should I have for breakfast? 
It's a crazy concept. I think it's, I think there's something that we need to tackle, but maybe not today. You know, you, I, when you were talking now, I just remembered there's this pyramid that I remember learning about at school. Yeah, the food pyramid. Yeah, and there's the, the carbs at the bottom. I yeah. think it's then the fruits and vegetables, then the protein, and then the fats. Yes. But I don't, I don't remember what comes after that. Like, I remember the, the way the pyramid looks, yes. but not how to use it. Yeah, there was so much information now on like how to have your plate and the percentage of carbs and proteins and fats. That, all that data and research has changed so much in the last five years. So it's really hard for us to now, you know, having left school, you know, more than five years ago for most of us listening, obviously. Oh, God. Um, a lot more. Um, <laughs> that information is outdated and not really relevant for us in today's society. So yeah, it is something we need to work on. So that's where I would say take, you know, a little bit of investment, a little bit of pocket money, do a bit of research. There's a lot of free information online. Make sure you qualify the sources that you're looking for your information from. Uh, they're credible and, and qualified. And, you know, it wouldn't hurt to apply a few of their methodologies. Okay, I'm going to ask you about something that's a bit controversial, and I'm sure you probably get that a lot as a trainer. Uh, EMS yes. or uh, electromuscle stimulation. Yes. Can you tell us more about that? Like, what is it? Is it good? Is it bad? So, it's EMS is, is massive. I'm going to say typically in the city here, GCC wide, I think it's more popular than it would be, let's say, from Australia where I'm from. I only really heard about it when I got here. Um, so e EMS more or less applies like a concept where you're sending electrodes into the muscles to amplify contractions of the muscles, which you do naturally do. Let's say, for example, I'm doing a bicep curl with a weight or two dumbbells, I'd be con contracting the muscles. When you go through the EMS protocol, while I'm still having to do the curl, so I'm not just going to be standing there in these sessions, it might be just my arm lifting. There's actually a machine or a suit that you're wearing and it's shooting these electronic kind of shocks, more or less, into the muscle and it's getting the muscle, forcing the muscle to contract. Now, the problem with things like EMS and a lot of other, I would say, quick hacks or easy ways to get in shape is obviously they're promoting it's only 20 minutes of exercise and you will look like this. Now, generally, if you look at the fine print, it says this should be done in conjunction with a four to five day training program and a modified or customized nutrition plan. And that's where we kind of come back to everything we've been speaking about today. It's kind of like, there's so many ways to skin a cat, but it's, it's ultimately down to like, we're just gonna keep beating around the fact that we need to just put in a little bit of work, focus on the simple things, do them well and do them consistently. I mean, if you do the 20 minutes of workout anyway, two to three times per week, that's better than nothing anyway, yeah, without it being EMS. Exactly, you almost don't need the EMS. If you're doing those three sessions, generally a lot of these like special like fad exercise types are usually quite expensive as well and, and unfortunately they give the health and wellness industry like an expensive stereotype you're like i can't afford training or it's so expensive to get in shape or i can't afford to be healthy or to be ex to exercise there are so many really affordable ways free ways like if you look at youtube for example all the apps now that you can get on apple fitness and all this kind of stuff there's so much information out there um, so that really it, it is an expensive process, but yes, just to summarize EMS, I would say is going to be something that, um, I would put it on the back burn, focus on three solid sessions at the gym and a nutrition plan. And then if you decide to give it a go, then why not? But also, I'm always big on saying, try it. I've had clients come to me in the past and I could sit, I could sit there and give a hundred reasons why I don't think something's. I should do, but ultimately I like people to actually make that decision for themselves because then they believe it and they also learn. So if I, I will say to somebody, yeah, go do a session, see what you think. Yeah, I know you some know. people who, who do it, as you mentioned, in conjunction. So they do, they do their normal workouts, yes. but like once per every two weeks, they yeah. do an EMS session because it kind of, because it kind of helps with the toning of the muscles. Okay. It helps more with the toning than normal workouts. Yeah. So they do their normal workouts, but then every two weeks they do an EMS session. Something. Yeah, I mean, look, like, I'm like, why not try it? Like, you know, if you if you want to dedicate that hour and go do something that's in a still a positive space, like we're not going to the bar and having, you know, a few drinks or food that we shouldn't be having or whatever it might be, we're going and trying a positive activity that's going to helpfully enhance our health and wellness, then yeah, I'm not one to say no to that. Try it. Um, I just think all we have to keep in mind is that there's always somebody out there trying to make money. And then ultimately, you know, for us, it's about getting to our result in the most direct way possible. You know, I really like that you said that because a lot of trainers have that, no, you got to go the hard way, you know, easy come, easy go. You got to put in the effort and, okay, yes, I know, but I also want to get results and I don't have the time or yes. the energy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So meet me halfway. Yeah, it's you've got to try find that middle ground. And like, I'm definitely, and for those who know me, who have worked with me before, I'm I would say I am quite strict when it comes to training, and I do push people quite hard. But it, the more important thing is to know that limitation and know where somebody's at, and then help them build. You know, not to set the bar here and just kind of have everybody else floating down below and feel like it's just unattainable to ever get there. I think our job as professionals in the industry, you know, and all trainers this should apply to is that our job is to, we know we're up here because our, we've lived and breathed this since, you know, we, we were born more or less, we've come through a more fitness or active lifestyle, or we've loved it and been passionate and we've gone down that career choice. But we have to come down and like help everybody else who may not have experienced that kind of come up and they may never get up to here. They might not want to. For a lot of people, they don't want to. You mentioned no hikes before at the start in the intro. I was like, no, we need to change that. There are some good hikes. You'll love that. But you might not want to be someone that's hiking every weekend. And that's totally fine. But it's like, can we get you being healthy? And everyone has that line. That line does apply to everyone. Because if I said to you, you know, do you want to live the longest life possible in the healthiest, most positive way? Everyone would generally say yes. And there is a threshold, unfortunately, that our bodies do require to be able to do that. Yeah, and, and I mean, not everyone can be the best at everything. So some people are trainers, some people are scientists, some people are just creatives and like we can all be on that different spectrum, yeah. so it's fine. You know what I love like in my industry, I see a lot of you guys listening and lady, men and women um, who are very, very successful in their careers. I see you in your most uncomfortable unnatural environment which is the gym when you're in your gym shorts and your t-shirt that you know you've not put this gym you don't never wear this t-shirt outside the house but now you're wearing it to the gym for the first time because you wouldn't normally go to the gym i see you in such an uncomfortable environment and that's where i'm there to kind of like look after you in that space it's the same if i go into your office block and everyone's in their suits with their ties and nice cars and this and that i feel very uncomfortable so i think it's knowing like where our space is and knowing that we can all kind of develop in that area it's just it's got to have some sort of value to it and you've got to be shown the right way as well it's very nice of you to say and yeah. i and i really like that you have that empathetic like we you know i know you're out of your comfort zone yeah. i know you're struggling with that squat but exactly yeah hang in there that's right that's what it's about, that's what it's about. amazing any other tips you want to say to our uh, um, listeners i mean look i think if there was something that I think everyone should get away from, I'm going to give you a few gems really quick. The first one's going to be sleep. Uh, we not touched on that too much. We've been speaking more about health and fitness and exercise and nutrition. Sleep is the fundamental foundation to all of this being successful. Okay, I could give you the best program on the planet. You could be with the best trainer. I could give you the best nutrition. I could cook you all your food. I could feed it to you, whatever. I could literally do all of that for you in the best of my ability. But if you have not slept, we are crashing down. So basically importance of sleep, as a lot of you will know, it's gonna help with obviously regulating a lot of our hormones, important hormones. It's gonna help with our recovery, our body's ability to think, cognitive function, recover, repair. So what happens if you notice this vicious cycle of poor qualities of sleep, you're gonna be waking up drowsy, generally in a bad mood. You're gonna have probably more than one coffee first thing in the morning. Probably gonna skip breakfast because you're running late to work. You're going to be angry and, and negative in the traffic because obviously there's traffic, you've not prepared for it, you're running late, you, over, you, you didn't sleep or you overslept or whatever it might be, you had a bad quality of sleep. Um, you're going through your work day, you're not performing as well as you should, you're having negative conversations with your peers and then you're getting home, rushing home, you're in a bad headspace, you're stressed, you're working till late and the cycle revolves. If you can get to bed earlier, so set a bedtime routine, you can set a a, a standard wake up time that allows you like a healthy routine in the morning. So spend some time with family, walk your dog, play with your cat, go for a walk, do a bit of exercise, drive in a calm manner to work, beat the traffic maybe, go to the gym. Um, but if you can set like that really healthy relationship around sleep, and for a lot of people that should be a minimum of six and a half hours, and it can be up to eight to nine hours depending on certain people. Uh, the studies have shown that females require longer sleep than males. Again, that's a, there's a lot of research around that conversation at the moment, but I would say sleep is the gold mine. So if you feel like you're struggling to get on top of your health and fitness, or you're not managing your nutrition, because cravings go through the roof when we're tired, you're going to want sugar and anything fatty and um, you know, comforting. So this is a, you know, a massive problem. So if you feel like you can't get on top of those things, I could probably guarantee that your sleep is poor. And I think let's start with that. And that's, I mean, it's almost, it's a free thing that you could try tonight. Set the bedtime, turn the phone off, 
and try to get eight hours and see how you go. So that's gem number one. Do so we have time for another one? Sure. Cool. My second one is going to be minimizing your caffeine because I've made these specific to our, our office friends. So you're obviously working hard all day. It gets to 4, 5 p.m. And then we're trying to hammer a few more coffees to get us through that last hour or two or for some of you, another five hours. The problem is you get home and then you're wired, you're unable to sleep. And that's going to affect our um, sleep quality through the night. So it kind of comes back to that first tip. So try to avoid having any caffeine, switch to a tea um, or a, a, you know, a decaf coffee perhaps, um, whatever it might be, but try to avoid no caffeine after 4 p.m. The last one is kind of two-pronged, but basically step one would be trying to stick to a calorie-based window of the day. So I find a lot of people have a really successful results with me when they try to have a window throughout the day. It's not necessarily intermittent fasting, which you would have may have heard of. There's different hours where you'll eat and not eat and there'll be set hours throughout the day. I call it like a calorie restricted window. So basically what happens is you try to stockpile your calories to a certain part of the day. So if you're somebody that goes home and eats so much food in the evening, try to then limit your intake up until lunch. So coffee, water, a bit of fruit, maybe go the gym protein shake. So you've only had a small amount of calories before lunch. And then the evening, that's when you would then have those comfort foods, but you've not been eating since you woke up. So generally, it's a little bit better with calories. Okay. Um, and that is kind of my main tips. The last one, can I give one more? I've got so many for you guys. You, you are my perfect audience, basically. But the last one is olive oil. So if you are noticing that obviously for a lot of us are eating sort of South Asian cuisine, Arabic cuisine. Um, you know, I would say they're the two main cuisines that love a little bit of Italian cuisine. They love olive oil. Olive oil, as amazing as it is, per tablespoon is 120 calories. Now, two tablespoons of olive oil is basically a Kit Kat. So it's so easy for you. You go to lunch with your colleagues. You have a, a dish, of, let's say hummus, for example. It's covered in olive oil. You get into it. You finish it off. People tell me, I had lentils for lunch. It's fine, right? And I'll be like, yes, but the calories of that small bowl of hummus was actually a Five Guys burger. So oh when we look at God. like, when we look at that, I know, right? So when we look at that energy balance, this is, I have to say this because everyone's like, oh no, my thank gosh. you. Just cut back on the olive oil. A tablespoon a day is amazing. Two tablespoons throughout the day is amazing. Obviously, so many health benefits for oils, healthy fats, cognitive function, um, joint inflammation, and that kind of stuff. But I would say just be conscious because it's something we all love and all of our favorite foods are sm uh, smothered in it. And I think it can be counterproductive sometimes. So that's hopefully, if you remember one thing from today's episode. It's the olive oil. 120 <laughs> calories per tablespoon. Think of it. Think about it before you eat it. But that's all I've got today. It was amazing. Thanks for having me on. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next episode is a super important one. It's about bullying. Contrary to popular belief, both children and adults can be subject to bullying. So tune in to know how to identify it and deal with it. We're available on YouTube, YouTube Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anagami, and Amazon Music. So take your pick. Stay well and keep thriving.